Hi, my name is Gary and I'm from Sportrader. I'm from the ads unit. Um, we're building a self-management platform in the sports betting industry and today I'm showing you the direction into the North Star or, at least, or how to deliver the best value for your customer. Um, but let me start with some foundation that you know what I'm talking about. The world is far from being a perfect place. We all live in a VUCA world. VUCA is a term which was introduced by the US Army back in 1980. Um, it stands for volatile, changes rapid and unpredictable in its nature. Uncertain. The present is unclear and the future is uncertain. Complex. Many different interrelated factors come into play with the potential of causing chaos and confusion. Ambiguous. There is a lack of clarity and awareness about the situation. So what does this mean now? It basically describes that when you're working in the tech industry, like nothing is clear. There can be a requirement change every second. There can be an outage of your services. There can be like a, a customer which is unhappy and wants to have a change. So nothing is set into stone. There can be and there will be always a change in the system. So we need to prepare for that. So what's the North Star direction now? It will not show you the way, but it will guide you. I think everybody wants at the situation where he stands in front of something and he doesn't know if you should go left or right. Northstar will help you to find the will find will help you to find the direction. Every human being is around is doing around 2,000 decisions per hour, which is roughly one decision every two seconds. The North Star will not show you the way to go, but it will show you the right direction you should head to. That's why it's called North Star. When I, when I planned my trip here from Vienna to Linz, I was not sure should I go by car, should I go by the train, should I go by the motorcycle or so. I just knew that it's around like two hours to the west. That's the direction I knew where I had to go. That's how the North Star is working. 10 guidelines to find the right direction. First one, customer obsessed. Work backwards from the customer. Non-functional requirements are top priority. So what does this mean? You should deliver the right value at the right time. There is no need for a feature which a customer needs now when you deliver it in months. The customer will then don't need it anymore. What's also important is availability and scalability. The customer has no value of a product which is unusable on high load. You should think about availability and scalability. You should deal with high loads of um, user access. You should build your application that it's stable, that it's not outaging every now in a while. Cross-functional. We should have cross-functional self-sufficient teams. This means we should keep the end-to-end -end capacities in the, in, the, in the team, from designer to architect to developer to QA. We should build and architect the software or the system for self-sufficiency. In the tech industry, I already had some years of experience and it was like really frustrating back then. For example, you had a problem on your production system. You, ha you had to file a ticket to your, I don't know, system administrator who keeps the access of the database. Then you need to wait, for example, one to two weeks that you're getting a database dump. This is really frustrating and it's not helping at all. So that's why we, tr we try to keep the, the, the knowledge in this team separate and should be cross-functional from A to B or A to C. End-to-end -end ownership. Take responsibility of your work. You build it, you ship it, you support it. It only counts when the customer use, uses it. Done is not always done. From my experience, what I also learned is that sometimes features are getting like treated as done, but it's really done when it's on production and the user has or can use it. Keeping the hostage, one of the hardest principles, probably in my opinion, but also the most important one. Just imagine you have your production service. You're getting attacked. Your production service is down or you're getting kept as a hostage, which happened some years ago to uh, another big company. Um, and they had a problem that they had a ransomware attack. They had to, I think, buy out with roughly 10 million euros that they are getting um, their services back because they got kept as a hostage. What we try or what we are doing is we go to GitLab, we change our AWS accounts, we deploy the new service, 
create a new production service, put in our, ba our database dumps again. So we are live again. We're just ignoring what happens. I mean, we're not really ignoring it, but we just put it by side, spin up a new service and the free again. And then we're investigating what happened. From that on, you have four rules more or less. You should test this process regularly. I mean, it's nice that you have it in place, but when you don't know how to do it, or if it really works, it's not really counting. We sh you should keep the backups in a separate account. What happens if your AWS account gets attacked? Your database dumps are also getting attacked. And if you lose your backups, you will have a big problem. So that's why have a backup strategy in plan, have at least one to two accounts separately where you can store your backups. Never hard code AWS resources. Um, for example, when you need to change then something, it gets really hard because you have dependencies to every service. You need to be able to be flexible. You need to change an AWS account and can spin up the instances again and it rewires basically on demand. And the only thing you should basically, basically be able to or need to do is go to GitLab, change your AWS account ID and spin up your services again. Of course, there will always be some manual work like putting in back database dumps, testing the application if everything works fine, but you should not be off for weeks. It should be a matter of hours or days in the worst case scenario. Elimination of rats. Take care of the tech debt and your quality. Um, track and resolving warnings frequently. This is a picture of um, Sonacube, which is a static code analysis tool. It helps you to find um, some problems or tech debt in your code base. It's basically scanning your code and is saying, hey, your code is nice or you have problems with that. You can imagine or just think of a card house. Your code base is a card house. When you have a bad foundation, which could happen with a bad code base, and you flip a card, what will happen? The, the whole house will fall apart. And this is a thing that we try to prevent. We should keep track of the warnings and are resolving tech debt frequently. Small frequent releases. We should follow invest and do frequent pushes to production. This follows basically the Scrum principle where invest is like a um, thing to write stories or how a schema to write stories, um, which will describe what is the outcome of a story or the, the user story. What will happen with that? We reduce the time from to do to done. It's basically like the first story. There is no value of a, of a feature when the customer can't use it right now. And also it helps you to deploy as fast as, as often as possible. Um, just imagine you have 20 features which are going live in one, one push and you have a bug. It's really hard to find out which feature is causing this issue. And when you deploy each feature sequence uh, on, on its own, it's way easier to track down also bugs and problems with this rollout. And also you have always the, the value for the customer on the end of the day. Transparency dispels myth. This is basically about cost tracking or KPI monitoring. You should track how many transactions you have in your system. What's the cost of your transactions and other relevant KPIs. It helps you to drive down your costs to bring best value for the customer. Also, it helps you on scaling because when your product is getting cheaper, you can scale better because then it, you save money. Also, the customer of the, on the end of the day is happier because you can drive down the costs for the customer. And I mean, Money today is kind of important and I think every customer out there would be happy to get the same service by a low, lower cost for the same value. Operational excellence. Don't let customers find bugs. We need to notice them earlier. You should always measure data quality and latency. You should keep track of invocations and errors happening in your application. And you should always get notified about errors and delays in your system because this could be an indicator that something is going on and something bad is going on, for example. What's also really important is to react on detection of anomalies. An anomaly is, for example, something when you have like, I don't know, let's, let's imagine you have 1,000 requests on average per minute, and suddenly you're getting up to 10, 20K. Something is going on there. What happens? Are you getting DDoSed or some, some other thing is happening? You should always be aware of that, what's going on in your system, because you should, need to find this issue earlier than your customer is noticing it. Continuous improvement. 
next month we should be better than last month. This is a promise that we're doing to our own. Quality is our responsibility. So when you're seeing a code piece, which is not maybe the best, Boy Scout it. There's a guidance in, in coding, which is called Boy Scout rule, where you can imagine like you're camping as a Boy Scout on a field and you're going there and on the end, you should leave it cleaner than it was before when you came. So that's when you do like a little change in the code base, you can always do some minor refactorings and make it clear, cleaner than it was before. You should write testable and high quality product or high quality code. This might sound like a unicorn right now. I know that it's not really feasible all the time because it's really hard. There's pressure all the time and so on. But we at Sportrata, we have 30% per sprint on improving quality in our system. You can, for example, refactor tech depths. You can um, learn something new. There's always room for improvement and you can do 30% per sprint to reach that quality code and this good testable code. And also we should eliminate the toil. Um, toil is basically every process which is manual, is repetitive and could be automated. For example, you're doing reporting. Your reporting takes one hour per average. And you do this five times a week, which means you spend five hours on this process. If you could invest time in an automated process, which would, which would probably take, I don't know, 20 hours for developing, after four weeks, you would reach the break-even point and this feature would already save you some money. Basically, eliminate repetitive processes. That's our improvement. And my favorite rule is, if it's not tested, it's broken. Do not make assumption that it works, verify it. You should have around 80% of test coverage. There is no hard rule, but you should strive for it. You should always make smoke tests and regression tests on every push. As well, infrastructure tests, integration tests and system tests should be also there in place. Because if you don't test it and you can't verify it, then you can assume it's broken. Because you can never be sure that it's that it's perfect. Yeah, so here on the last slide, I summed it up again. So basically, 10 rules, cross, uh, custom obsessed, cross-functional end-to-end ownership, keeping the hostage, elimination of red, small frequent releases, transparency dispels myth, operational excellence, continuous improvement, and if it's not tested, it's broken. Thank you.